conclusion of the meeting, there will be insurance agencies set up in the lobby to answer residents' specific questions or concerns. Due to the time constraints in our efforts to get everyone home and event concluded by APM, please hold any questions during the presentations. And with that, I'd like to introduce Laura Page, Town of Paradise Disaster Recovery Director. Good evening, everyone. It is my pleasure for the first time to be here tonight and um, see everyone. I'm so happy that I was able to join the Town of Paradise team. It's a mighty team. We call it the A team. And it's just been very exciting getting on board and becoming very familiar with all the town-led recovery projects that you said were a priority. And I'm very excited to work on that. But tonight, I just wanted to give you a little brief update. You may or may not know, but last week, we issued a joint press release with the county regarding, the tree, regarding tree removal. And we're calling this debris program phase two. And as you may be aware, FEMA did approve uh, our, our ability to remove trees, they're gonna, at their cost, remove trees on private property that will affect the public right away. So that's been approved, and we will be getting that up and going soon. Also, we're continuing to work. They had questions about, we had also asked for them to remove trees on private property that are on private or orphan roads. They asked us for some more information. We have a meeting with them on Friday. FEMA and Cal OES is supporting us. And we'll be working to answer all of their questions. And hopefully, they will be approving that part of the program. The town and the county did request to remove tree, have them remove trees within the, just the living areas. And unfortunately, that does not fit within the program, FEMA's public assistance program. So the town is working on a hazard mitigation grant that we will be submitting to FEMA uh, in a couple of, less than a couple of weeks to help us, to help you remove those other trees. Um, and in, in the meantime, wanted you to make sure that you knew about the USDA pilot program. We have that updated on our website and there are some eligibility factors to, in order to participate in that program, but take a look at that. There's a $10,000 grant that you can apply for and to be used for tree removal or vegetation management. And there's also a $40,000 loan that can be coupled with that. And it's a low interest loan over 20 years. But all the information is in on the website. The USDA representative that can answer your specific questions, contact information is there. So please avail yourself of that opportunity. Um, also wanted to let you know, just to remind you some of the things that we've posted on the website since our last meeting is that there, um, you may be eligible for deferred property taxes uh, postponement program. And you can also go and visit their website and find out the particulars of that and how you apply. And again, this is all posted on Make It Paradise. Um, wanted to remind you the PG&E wildfire assistance program, the deadline to submit an application is November 15th. So that's coming up quickly, and they say that eligible payments to applicants will all be made by January 15, 2020. Regarding PG&E, one thing we see so many of you in the building department, and we're so excited every day to see you there. I know sometimes it's a long wait, and, but we just, we're so excited that you're there, and we're, every time the bell rings when a new permit is issued, we're just, everybody's excited. And everybody that comes to the Town of Paradise for meetings knows what that bell means, and everybody always stops and claps. So we're all in this together, and it's exciting. Um, anyways, PG&E wanted to make sure that, they, that you know that when you pull a permit, you still have to submit an application to PG&E for your electricity. It isn't automatic that when you pull the building permit that that are, we are notifying them, you yourself have to then apply with PG&E directly. So please, just as a reminder. And also, as we're wrapping up phase one of the debris removal program, anyone that's on the alternate program and you're using your own contractor, it is imperative that you submit your work plans to the county ASAP. So please, I know the county's been, and the town are making, doing outreach to people, and we're just asking if anyone is in that situation to please uh, get your work plans in ASAP. 
And then the last but not least, I just wanted to thank Butte Glen Medical Society. They came tonight and they just got done uh, preparing their care in our community directory. And it's a directory to healthcare services and providers in Butte County. So I know that everybody's been kind of, you know, people have been moving around and our providers have been too, but they've done an exhaustive and extensive list to help you. So please make sure they have their pamphlets that they're right there. See Anna. So thank you. That's uh, all I have for tonight. And I look forward to seeing all of you in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Next up we have the U.S. Census Bureau, David Benuelos. Just to let everybody know, there is seating upstairs if you're not wanting to stand in the back. It's available. All right. Ooh. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, pleasure to be here this evening, uh, early evening. My name is David Banuelos. I am one of the uh, partnership specialists for Region 1, which is uh, San Joaquin to the Oregon border. I am also the team lead, um, also known as supervisor. Um, so I've been out here doing multiple presentations uh, in various communities, as well as uh, here locally in Paradise. Uh, today, I, I really want to just give an overview what the census is, why we census, uh, how important it is to uh, many of our of our community programs. Um, I also have a few slides in here that relate uh, specifically to this community on how we are, will be attempting to count everybody. Um, but first off, uh, we as, as partnership specialists, many of us are first-time employees with the federal government. I, for example, am a teacher uh, as well as nonprofit social service provider for over 20 years. Um, the census is important to me because I've, I've provided many, many youth programs, family programs, employment, educational programs, and they've been funded um, through census money. So again, I, I will be touching base on, on some of my experience just so I can relate you know, why it is important to me, and hopefully um, you know, you'll find something that you can gravitate to and understand why it's important to you as well. So why we do the, the census. First off, it's, it's written in the Constitution. So in 1790 was the first time the census was done. Um, and really for three major, major issues. Um, redistricting, apportionment, which means uh, allocation of funds and, and, and distribution of funds, as well as the um, ensuring that all, all communities have access to the appropriate funds that they're due based on the account of the population of that area. One of the biggest things that is of concern, whether it's the census or just our everyday lives for those of us that have bank accounts, that have email addresses, is confidentiality. How do we ensure that our information is kept safe? The first and most vital aspect is Title 13. What Title 13 is, is a reassurance of federal penalty if one piece of information is shared maliciously outside of the census, what that could possibly lead to is five years imprisonment in federal penitentiary, as well as $250,000 per piece of information. While that may not make you feel all warm and fuzzy and, and feel like that's going to keep your information secure, it is really about the understanding of the processes that are set into place. So we not only have Title 13, but also Title 26, which relates to IRX and tax information, which those penalties are seven years in a penitentiary and three quarters of a million dollar dollars per piece of information. So this is something I like to make sure we, we focus on as we go out into the community and do these presentations because this is very, very important to all of us, ensuring that our information is kept confidential. Um, on the other side, there's many of us that may have done, I know there's, I'm not doing a plug for any one of these, but those uh, genetic um, little programs where you can test your blood or your, your uh, saliva and find out about your genetics. A lot of that comes from the census. And what that may now make you think is, so you, you're telling me to do the census, but you're also telling me that you, I can find out about people or my family or others. In 73 years, you can. 
and that's how it is set up. So when you do the census, all information is locked and kept tight for 73 years. After that fact is when you can do the ancestry dot whatever um, and find out who or and where your family has come from. But that's that's an important piece that that plays a role, especially nowadays where a lot of people are doing those ancestry tests to find out where where their ancestors have come from. So again, with the confidentiality, um, we as the census we fall under the Department of Commerce. This. Department of Commerce and the Census um, really interact um, or don't interact because everybody functions in silos. So whether you're Homeland Security, CIA, any of these other uh, law enforcement agencies, everybody functions individually and there is no sharing of information. So I know there's a lot of sentiment out there in the community about, well, they might get my, my information or what about them? It's kept unique within each, each department. So again, the census falls under the Department of Commerce, which does not share with any of these listed agencies or any others that are not listed. Again, why does, why does the census matter? 675 billion, 675 billion is what is distributed annually across the nation. So when we are doing the census when we are getting counted, and that's really what the census is about, is counting the number of people um, for statistics purposes. We're, we all become numbers, that's, that's really what happens. And at that point, based on those numbers, that's where we can find out should our local district maybe be extended because there has been previous historical undercounts and other people that are now being counted means we also should probably get another representative. Um, Additionally, with the um, rolling into uh, how that funding goes into our communities, again, my background, education, nonprofit, there's various check marks up here that I have uh, requested funding for for my community. Um, again, you, you may be talking about um, you know, career centers, uh, senior centers, WIC, Head Start, um, a lot of these social service entities that are in every community, they get they receive federal funding. Um, additionally, that is where a lot of the access to programs at our schools come from. One thing that, you know, again, I, I try to relate to my audience and my, the, the community members that I'm speaking with, um, we all drive, most of us drive. I'm not gonna say we all drive. Most of us drive or are in some type of mobile transportation on the streets. Most of us know as we're going to and fro from work or school or family's houses, we drive around those potholes. Every community has a pothole. I know I have plenty in my community. There's one example of how the census is worked into our communities and why it's so vital to understand that I know the, the potholes down the street that have been there for years that I have a problem with, census money. That's how it will get fixed. Next. So what does that mean for California? So in 2016, um, all of California received over $115 billion. Again, this was distributed through, I had a few check marks up there, but this was distributed through 55 different federal programs that are accessible across the state. And again, the census happens every 10 years. This is why we call it the decennial census, but ultimately, there are other activities and other um, surveys that are done that help supplement the census because I've heard, well, how much data do you really know if you're only asking every 10 years? There's also other surveys that are done to ensure that we are um, uh, extracting information from different communities. Um, and many of these surveys are done across the nation randomly. So I know when I just first started this job about six months ago. Um, Two weeks into this position, my mom called me. She was very excited and she says, I got the American Community Survey. I've never done it before. I'm excited to do it. Um, and I, so quick story, uh, again, um, my family is actually from the Bay Area. Uh, I live with my, my immediate family in Sacramento. We have the understanding that many of our community members are scared to do the census have never done the census. Um, so the, one of the biggest points of conversation I've informed my friends, my family, my neighbors of is why it's important to me. Each one of us have a, a unique value in ensuring that our community gets that money, whether you're a veteran, whether you're a teacher, 
um, whether you're a highway patrolman, there's so many different uh, programs and access points that this funding needs to come into to ensure that we, we get the money we all deserve. How will we be counted? Uh, perfect. So 95% of the nation will receive an invitation in the mail. 5% will then uh, may not receive it in the mail and may receive uh, uh, somebody on their door. Um, and then that, that last 1% is what, the, what we call our enumerators, the ones that will be in the community knocking on those doors. <clears throat> and it really ensuring that no matter how you receive it, or and, and we'll get into it in just a second, how you want to reply back is really on your own accord. And so in all previous censuses, they've never done the internet. This is the first time. In 2010, there was a big uproar of, you know, internet's getting big, we have Wi-Fi, we have all these new tools. Well, that's great for those that have it in areas that have access to it. What if you don't? If you do not, you still have access to reply back over the phone, um, in paper, or in person. And when we say in person, um, one, one of the, the strategies the census is, is implementing is uh, census assistance centers and census assistance kiosks. What those mean are, for example, um, Butte County Library is one of my the biggest partners locally that I have. They are going to be putting um, computers out in, in their lobby as well as computers, I'll say, behind or a few steps away so the community can come in and, and do the census there. Again, we want to make sure that all communities have access to fill out the census in the safest way, in the easiest way that is for them. So again, you can do it on your phone. A lot of us have our little little devices. You can jump on that. Again, phone, email, or in person. So again, the mailing strategy. So at the very top, you'll see March 12th. That week of March 12th is when the mailers will be blasted out across the nation. Um, the following week, uh, or about a week or so, and these, these are going to be varied schedules for different communities. So um, generally speaking, that following week, you'll get a reminder um, if you have not responded yet. And then by the end of the month, you'll receive another reminder postcard. By April, the beginning of April, April 8th is when you will get your final notice. At that point, there will be a process that we call um, non-response follow-up in which our enumerators will actually be in the community knocking on doors saying, hey, we noticed you didn't do the census. We're here to help you. We can do it right here with you. We can uh, give you a, a, a phone number or we invite you to, to your local community to do your census. And then lastly, at the very end of April is when the final, final postcard will go out. Um, again, we're really hoping that there's a lot of uh, energy and activation from all communities um, because there's really two, two big, big things that happen in our nation next year. April 1st is census. Anybody else know what another big event is next year? Voting, yes. So again, you know, really getting our communities to be civically aware civically engaged and activated so that all of our communities get their census money and that all of us are making sure that our voices are heard. This is just a quick overview of, of the general time frame. So at this point, we are still doing, um, or, or just had to have already passed in through our address canvassing, where we have staff that are going out and identifying where our mailboxes, where our households, where are people living. Um, and again, f flowing through it up through April 1st, Census Day, our group enumeration, as well as uh, towards the end is that non-response follow-up. So as partnership specialists, what is our role really is to do information and awareness training and presentations. We understand that there are many communities that what we call and have termed hard to count are, and here's just a few of them. So yes, you have your veterans, your, your refugees, your renters, um, Native Americans, senior citizens. There are so many other additional groups. Each one of these are unique in that they may have their own sentiment to why they want to do it, why they don't want to do it, why they deserve the money, why they really don't care about it. 
again, we want to make sure that we're bringing everybody into this conversation to ensure that there is an understanding that this is for the benefit of our community. Whether you believe so or not, our children, our roads, our education for the kids, our hospitals, these are, this is all the different avenues that this, this money supports. So as, as we're out in the community, we, we're, we're a few people. We, I have a team of 12 that covers 21 counties. So we're, we're out working hard every single day, most times six days a week, days, evenings, as, as we are here tonight. Um, the, the other big part of this is as we go into the enumeration and getting close to April 1st, that's when we need all of our enumerators. Again, these are the individuals that will be knocking on doors. Their positions that are part-time, that are full-time, we, what we want is our people that live in, in each community to apply to work in that community. Why? Because they understand the ins and outs of where people live. In, for example, Paradise. What's going on in this, in this community is so unique that it's hiring somebody local from Paradise would understand potentially people might be over here for this weekend or are coming over here for this convening or this presentation. Where do we find our community members at? So everyone can go to um, census.gov and we have our different job opportunities, everything from upper level supervisors and managers uh, down through our, our enumerators, our clerks, uh, our staff at our local area office here, uh, here in Chico. But this is, this is one of the biggest pushes outside of why we do the census is to ensure that we're getting the right people on board because we want individuals that understand that community. So again, how can, how can we help you? How can you help us is any opportunity there is for us to do presentations. Um, I know tomorrow evening I'm, I'm going to be presenting to uh, the local PTA in the, in, the, in the school district that I live in because my kids went to school there and I, I still know some of the principals and teachers getting into you know your local career centers getting into your local hospitals and clinics getting into places that are safe for people that are uh, that ultimately have access to the trusted leaders because when david comes out and i do a presentation nobody knows who i am nobody has trust in david yet but when a community partner that has a long history of uh, best serving that community invites david the community perceives it differently so again you know, the, the more we can help promote the, any opportunity there is for us to present, we welcome that. Um, I'll be out in, in the lobby with some information and some cards, so please feel free to stop by, ask me questions, and grab any cards you may need. So I'm going to go into a few of these slides that actually um, relate to, to Paradise and how we're going to do the enumeration. So first off, the census counts everyone once, only once, and in the right place. We also count people at their usual place of residence. That's where they normally uh, live and sleep on a daily basis. One thing that is a little different that we're doing is obviously, again, uh, with Paradise, is how we're going to type uh, or how we're going to count everyone. There's a term that most of us all know as homeless. There, that is a, a universal term that, that most people say, well, that means that right there. It actually means a whole lot more, and there's, there's going to be more presentations that I and my team will be coming out to provide to talk exactly about how we're going to count Paradise with the understanding that people are, are mobile, they are transitioning back to their homes, back to where, wherever they, they were living at, as well as ensuring that, you know, if they're staying on somebody else's property, we know that we need to count them there right now. So there's a number of factors that really go into how we're going to count the, the, the burn area. Um, and with, with enumeration, it's, it's really about understanding that, so in, in any, any given neighborhood, you have different blocks. A certain amount of blocks equal a track. And that's, that's how we count areas, is understanding how many, what are blocks, how many addresses are on that block, what is the tract, how, how big is that tract. Um, with, with fire burned areas, we have to understand that people have now been displaced or are in other areas. They may still may be in paradise. They still may be in the county. They may also be living somewhere else. Um, for example, the Santa Rosa fires. I had family that, that came to live with us. Those children of, of our, our cousins are actually still with us because they enrolled in school in our local area. So again, understanding that even our family that's going back to Santa Rosa intends to go back. 
but we're not sure when they will. So again, it's counting everybody where they're at the day of, um, and also it's not listed up here, but the, the census will not be counting post, uh, post offices, post boxes. And the reason being is you can live anywhere in the world and have a post office, uh, post box in, the, in this local area. So there's gonna be more information coming out on how we're gonna account for everybody, but I just wanted to give a, a, a quick overview. So a, a couple of pieces of information, how we get our data. So we get part of our data from CAL FIRE. We also get two annual updates from the US Postal Service. So these are just two other pieces of, of data that goes into our mapping system, which is called Rome. Um, this, this Rome mapper really addresses all of the hard to count areas. As I've worked with uh, different registrar's offers for voting in different counties, they use the same mapping. Uh, political uh, political folks that are going after you know a local uh, placement they're using the same data so that is a great tool that's on our, our website again going back to my my previous experience as a uh, teacher and nonprofit provider I wrote a lot of grants I, got, I have to understand who I'm serving what are my outcomes what are my populations like and that's all on, on the uh, the Rome mapper uh, next one please so really, um, the next steps is really preparing yourselves and your community to be counted. Um, as, as I mentioned, and I'll continue to say, we're going to be out in the communities doing a lot of work, um, getting our faces out there, getting our information out there. The more you can help promote us, um, or just have those conversations at the dinner table, or you know, after church. Uh, at, at, again, I'm going to PTA tomorrow. I'm going to talk with a lot of other parents I know, just to help energize them. Um, this is something that's very exciting to me. It may not be to everybody, but I want to try to reinforce that, uh, that the, the fact that this is so impactful and that this is really our future is in this money. There is my contact information. Feel free to take a picture. Uh, feel free to write it down. Like I said, I will be out in, in the back lobby if you have any questions. Um, again, I, I really want to promote recruiting, recruiting, recruiting. We want to hire. We have great jobs. We have great paying jobs. And we want to make sure that these folks from this local community are hired locally. So, for example, when you, when you apply, you actually put in your zip code. That's how we know where you're living at by the zip code that you apply through. Um, Lastly, I just want to leave you with my little pizza story. So again, I'm a, I'm a teacher. I go out and do a lot of presentations. I was at a uh, young Latino youth summit at Sacramento State University my, um, in my backyard. And I was doing a presentation with these, these young leaders. And they were talking about you know, how they're going to do this movement and why they're going to get involved in this or that. And so I came in to, to quickly talk about the census. As I'm doing so, the pizza starts coming in. I was a high school guy, I was an athlete, I know when I'm hungry, I don't pay attention to nothing else but the pizza coming in the room. That's what they did, naturally so. So at that point, I, I redirected their focus back to me and said, the census is like pizza. What happens is, I'll, I'll order pizza. This is the, if I'm the Department of, of Commerce and I'm ordering pizza so that every single one of you gets a piece, how do I know you're here if you don't tell me you're here? Do you all want a piece of pizza? I want my peace, you deserve your peace. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Um, next up, we have Rebuild Paradise, Charles Brooks and Holly Fisher. Good evening. Well, uh, my name is Charles Brooks, and this is Holly Fisher. We're both Paradise residents. Um, I believe Holly, your entire life in Paradise, and you worked at Feather River Hospital. My family and I, we've been here 14 years, and right after the fire, we, uh, my family and I decided to start the Rebuild Paradise Foundation to help people just like yourselves sitting in the audience recover and rebuild this community. And so thank you for allowing us to speak. One of the topics that we were tasked with in a meeting with the Town of Paradise was everybody's asking about insurance. What can we find out about who's insuring? Where can they go? That type of thing. And I thought this is a perfect thing that we can take on. Happy to do it because it's going to bring information to the community we care so much about and we want to see rebuilt. 
I'm just assuming by the amount of people in here that you all care about getting insurance again or finding out about rates. We're gonna address some generalities tonight and the insurance professionals that are here that you can meet with out in the lobby, they're gonna be able to correct any slight misinformation we might have. We're not insurance professionals. We've been coached by a few of them to make sure we're providing the most accurate information. But again, um, it's generalities to, to help you understand uh, insurance availability here in town. Um, so next slide, please. So our foundation, our mission is to support the long-term rebuild effort of Butte County's disaster-affected residents, business, and workforce. That's what we're doing day in and day out. A lot of the stuff we do is behind the scenes, and then we get opportunities like this where we can come out and support the public in person. Uh, next slide. So this insurance project that we have taken on, what you're seeing right now from us is the beginning of phase number one. When we, when we started with this, we realized that there is a lot more to this than just who's giving insurance and, and who's providing policies here. So right now, our goal tonight is to give you a basic insurance education and provide current insurance availability information. If you're looking for information on commercial insurance and manufactured housing, we're gonna have a report out on that later this year. That's a whole nother thing we're gonna tackle, but right now we wanted to focus on um, existing structures and also um, stick built homes because that was um, kind of the, uh, the initial phase here. Now, getting into phase number two, this is the part that's gonna, that's gonna take some time. And when you start looking at insurance and you talk to insurers, you're gonna start hearing terms like risk modeling and to help you figure out the risk of where your, your home at your specific address. So we're tackling this project and trying to understand how does risk modeling play into the insurance we all need so desperately, and how does that affect, what inputs do the risk modeling companies that then advise the insurance companies on how to establish your rates, what type of inputs are involved in that? Do they take mitigation efforts, like you trimming your trees or clearing your brush, or the community becoming firewise, or the town passing ordinances that have to do with how we maintain maintain our relationship with the trees and with the brush. So we're, we're working to understand that, have conversations with risk modeling companies so we can have better information to them about a willing community. The Paradise community, the Ridge, we need to get them better information and we need to be a willing participant to get more insurers back here and to help our rates. Because if we just sit silently and don't do anything, Rates are established and, and we're not trying to help the equation. So that's part of the advocacy work that we're doing on behalf of our community is to try and open up that line of communication with insurers and with risk modelers to help our rates and eventually our insurability to have us more options. But as you can see by the lobby out there when you walked in, we have options, which is really encouraging. Uh, the last thing is phase three. That's where we bring home the results of this, and then we pay it forward to other communities. There are a lot of communities that are positioned just like Paradise was before November 8th, and if we can take our experience and we can help benefit them so they can change the way that they interact with the wildland urban interface and they can then recover some insurability, well then we're doing our job and we're not only helping our community but others who are just like us and hopefully don't have to suffer the same fate. Next slide, please. So now I'm gonna hand this over to Holly, who's gonna talk uh, a little bit about insurance specifics and the requirement for your individual addresses. Before we get too much um, into what's currently available, it's really important to talk a little bit about um, how insurance carriers decide if they're going to insure your home or not. Um, when I began this project, I thought that it would be a super simple answer. I'd make a couple phone calls, and it'd be black or white. Well, it, it sure isn't. Um, in fact, it's very, very address specific. And I don't mean to each town, each neighborhood, or street. I mean to the exact number at the home of or, or your address. Um, and in order to better understand this complex situation, we have to dig a little bit deeper into the insurance world um, and in doing so, these two terms are very important, and that is fire lane score and protection class. Just one minute. So step one is you've, you've picked up the phone, right, and you're gonna call an insurance agent or broker. Um, that insurance agent is gonna ask you for your address. And they need your address because they're gonna plug it into a database that's gonna give them the protection the, the, excuse me, the fire line score and the protection class of your address. And in most cases, it's those two things that are gonna help them determine whether they're gonna give you 
insurance and what type of policy that's gonna be. So what are these two things? Why do they bear so much power? So we're gonna break it down a little bit. So a Fireline score is a modeling system developed either by the insurance carrier themselves or by a paid third-party service. And it looks at three main factors. The first thing being fuel. So the brush around your home, the trees, um, grass. The second thing being the slope of your property. Are you right on a canyon edge? Is there a big grade in your yard? Um, the bigger slope, the faster a fire can spread. And then the third thing would be access to your property. Um, is your home easily accessible or are you at the end of a gravel road? It's hard for big equipment to get in there and turn around. That's a fire line score. Okay, so now protection class. Protection class is a fire protection ranking system. How easily defendable is your home? Again, it looks at three main things. The first one being um, fire departments in your area. How many stations are open? Is that a full-time fire station with paid employees or is it a volunteer fire station that's only staffed seasonally? Second thing being the water supply system in the community. Are you on a public utility water system? Do you have a well? How close is your home to a fire hydrant? Those types of things. And then the third thing being fire alarms, communication systems, telephone, um, the systems in your community related to that. So protection class is ranked on a numerical um, scoring system, one to 10, one being excellent scoring, you're doing really well in all of those categories, 10 being not very good protection availability. Now we had um, one of the local insurance agents help us out just giving us a very general idea of what we're looking at for our community areas. So again, very broad generalization here, but if you have a home in Chico, your protection class is most likely around a three. Paradise, we're looking at two to threes, which is really good. Megalia tends to be around a four. Forest Ranch, Cohasset, and Sterling City communities are more like eight or nines in their protection class. So back to step one, where you've made that phone call, you picked up the phone, you called that insurance agent, they entered in your address into their database, and they've given you a score now for your address. So let's say, for example, they say your Fireline scores of five, in your protection class of three. So now with that information, they're gonna discuss policy options with you. Please hear them out and then shop around because everybody is going to be willing to take on a different score, take on different risks. Okay. And then we'll talk a little bit about those, um, those policy options. There's three policy options. Um, they are not created equal and they don't cost the same either. Um, option number one would be a policy with an admitted carrier. And these are carriers that are very uh, well known to all of us, I'm sure. Um, I listed a few of them up here. And then there's also a link to the California Department of Insurance's website where they have a full list of all admitted carriers. Um, the second option would be a non-admitted carrier. That type of policy, you've probably heard um, some of these thrown around as well. Um, a lot of good names in the industry, but a little bit different, and I'm gonna go over that. And then uh, option number three would be a California Fair Plan, which I know we've all heard about as well. Um, if you have that third option, that California Fair Plan, you're also going to have um, what's called a wraparound or a companion policy. There's different names and terminology for that. Basically, you have two policies that then together give you a comprehensive, traditional type policy. So we're gonna look at those three options again a little bit closer. Option number one, that admitted policy, that admitted carrier um, is going to have to comply with California state regulations, which gives us as a customer 
um, a sense of security if your claim is mishandled or if the company fails, goes bankrupt, um, you have the state you can go to and they can step in and they can help make payments, they can um, help you with your claim. Option number two, that non-admitted carrier. Um, again, some really well-known um, names in the industry, but they do not necessarily have to comply with state regulations. There is no recourse available if you have a mishandled claim. You cannot go to the California um, Department of Insurance and file a claim against them. And if that company fails, there's no guarantee that you are going to get paid with your claim. The California Fair Plan. This is called a limited peril policy, meaning that it, um, it only is going to cover you for things that are Mother Nature caused. Um, things like wildfire. It is available to all California homeowners, so it is an option. You would want to make sure that you're using a, an agent or a broker that is very um, experienced in writing this type of policy because value estimations for your policy coverages are done by you or, your, or in conjunction with your insurance agent. And then you're going to write a separate policy or a wraparound companion policy to fill in all the holes that the California Fair Plan is not covering you for. Examples being like theft or um, you have a water leak in your kitchen or somebody's suing you because they got hurt on your property. Those are things that that um, companion or wraparound policy are going to help you, help you with. <clears throat> now, wraparound policies are written by several of our local agents um, with those well-known admitted um, carriers are willing to write those wraparound policies. Um, of course, this is not an ideal situation because you now have two policies, which means you have two premiums and two deductibles. So it is most likely the most expensive option. So now that um, we've talked about a few main things, you know what a fire line score is, you know what protection class is, you also know the three different types of policies. Um, Charles is going to kind of put those all together and we have a few examples up here for you of very specific addresses here on the ridge and so we can kind of show you the different policy options that, um, that we're looking at. Thank you, Holly. Let's check our time here. Okay, so now that you guys have that, that that knowledge of what's going on, we decided to pick six strategic locations on the ridge, um, and we have changed the addresses to protect the innocent. And so when we go through this list, this will kind of give you some examples of topography, where you're located, protection class, you'll see some differences. And if you happen to know these roads um, or these areas, you may understand why. Um, so what we did was there's there's too many variables to cover my house was different than your house and your house Everything is different. So we said, okay, if we have a if, if we're building a new house, we're rebuilding 1800 square feet three to um, Stucco stucco siding will we comply and everything's good to go um, Two car garage and in, and this is an important thing when you guys go to talk to your insurance uh, the insurance agent and when you do your annual review you want to make sure you have things in there like code upgrades and extended replacement costs. Those are the things that, would, God forbid, we had another event like this. These are the things that are going to step in and help make up that difference between what you were insured for and hopefully what disaster economics has laid in front of us, kind of what most of us are experiencing now. So the, the quotes that we got from a, from a well-known national insurance provider who is insuring on the ridge is displayed up above. So Row Road, that's number one down there on the bottom. That house, uh, the annual policy, $3,250. That requires a California Fair Plan and a wraparound policy because it's a fire line score of six and a protection class of two. We are really lucky in the town of Paradise with our protection class. We have great, fi uh, great fire infrastructure and a great communications network. Um, once you get outside the town limits, you're gonna see that those protection class, or if you get into some of the more rural private roads within the town, you'll see that that protection class falls. Um, number two, on the canyon on the east side of Paradise, off of Pence. So that's Jensen Court, so it's off of Malibu. 
Um, Fireline score six, protection class two, very similar to number one, about $3,800 a year for this particular home. Now we jump about a mile away, mile and a half to Central Paradise, um, where now we're in a Fireline score of three and protection class two. This insurer was willing to insure you because of those scores, and they're gonna give you a standard policy, no California fair plan, you've got one deductible, you've got one insurance payment. $1,385 a year for the exact same home. So you can see the drastic difference in address specifics. Then just to jump up in the, in the interest of time, we took number six that's up in Megalia um, in the POA and Fireline score protection class four, California fair plan plus wraparound policy, $3,125 a year. Now this was kind of an outlier, Woodland, um, Woodland Drive in Paradise, number four. Um, if you've driven down Woodland, you probably will understand the protection class um, associated with that road, but Fireline score nine, right on the canyon. Protection class nine, um, if you travel down that road, fire, you know, that um, fire hydrant infrastructure might be, it might be further apart than it used to be, or that, excuse me, that, that modern streets have had on it. So that would explain um, the rates there. Um, next slide, please. So what we're gonna have available for you in the back, if you can't stay to meet with some of the insurance companies, Holly and I will be at a table. We have this particular handout here, which many of the insurers who are in the lobby out here are listed on this form, and it kind of goes through these. And these are people you can reach out to that are insuring on the ridge. Um, and, and all that we have talked to in the last month to bring you this information. And you can see by the matrix that they're selectively writing new policies insured by them. Um, some may require a wraparound policy based on your address. Um, with all of these listed and the agents that we talked to, none of them are saying that they are flat out not insuring people. So this is a good sign. We do have insurance options. Next slide, please. Okay, so next steps. Get ready for that meeting with your insurance agent. I doubt the agents that are back here are gonna be able to go through all these steps with every one of you, but when you set that appointment with your insurance agent or a few of these folks, you're gonna to wanna to know in your head what type of home are you rebuilding or what type of home do you currently have? What's it made out of? Get an idea for how much you have in the way of contents. This is a big one, other structures. If you have that really cool shop out on the back that's 1,200 square feet and really neat, make sure that that's insured because otherwise the other structures in your policy may only give you $30,000 instead of it being valued at almost $200,000 in a rebuild. Um, accessory dwelling units, non-attached garage, sheds, all that stuff. Shop early. Shop, you know, make sure you reach out to multiple people. Quotes can take three to five days. So if you don't hear back from somebody the next day or they don't give you an answer right away, be patient. They are bombarded right now with, uh, with quotes. Um, find a carrier that you can trust. The relationship that you have with insurance now is more important than ever. Before this, you may have talked to your insurance agent once a year, once every two years, once every five years. Now's the time to get to know them and make sure you trust the advice that they're giving. If they say something that sounds weird, Go get a second opinion, just like a doctor. Don't, don't trust them on the first go-around. Um, if they're writing a California fair policy, just like Holly said, make sure they're experienced at fair policies. Get the insurance level that you need. You gotta cover all those dwellings. Don't just go for the lowest rate because otherwise you're gonna find yourself in an underinsured situation. Make sure you're at the level of insurance you need. Um, review and update your policy at least annually. Make sure you, you set that appointment and you listen to that agent who says, things have changed. We learned this. Changes like this can help you save money. We're now allowing you to present the type of construction that your house is made out of, so we're gonna reduce those rates. Or if you do this, as insurers start taking mitigation, your individual efforts into account, when they get to that point, those are the things you're gonna wanna know about and you're only gonna know if you meet with them annually. Finally, meet those insurers outside after this. And then uh, again, feel free to grab one of these if you want from us, if you can't stick around. This is also gonna be available on makeitparadise.org. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, talk to Holly and I, but we're uh, very happy to have you guys listen to us tonight and we hope you found it helpful. Thank you, Charles and Holly. Okay, last up, we have the California Department of Insurance, Deputy Commissioner Tony Signorali. Good evening, everybody. My name is Tony Signorelli, Deputy Commissioner for Consumer Services and Market Conduct with the Department of Insurance. 
and I'm going to talk about a couple of different issues tonight. I won't spend too much time on availability of insurance, which was the, the second topic I'll talk about since you heard a, a good deal about it there, but I'll add some things that uh, weren't presented in the previous presentation. So first, let's talk about claims. Uh, I know some of you here experienced either a, a total loss or a partial loss with a standing home, and I wanted to provide some information that we're seeing with regard to either the 2017 fires that people are experiencing about now, you know, two years down the road, or what we're seeing in this area almost one year uh, after uh, the campfire. So the first, obviously, you, the first thing you heard about doing is debris removal, and that was the consolidated debris removal program that many of you joined in on, and some of you went private. So if you went private and did your own debris removal, uh, the way that works, and a lot of this information you'll, you already know, but I want to make sure that, you know, we're giving as much information as possible, that when you spend that 50000 or whatever it is to remove that debris on your own privately, that will come out of initially your coverage A, your dwelling coverage, and then if you do have extra coverage for debris removal, let's say 5% on top of that, once you've reached your policy limits, as you're rebuilding the home, that additional 5% will kick in. If you don't have it, that additional 5%, then the debris removal cost will just be borne by your, your dwelling coverage, your other structures coverage, and sometimes your contents coverage. If you did go through the consolidated program, then there's one of the benefits of it is the agreement with the insurance industry and with, the, with FEMA and Cal OES and the, all the partners was that the obligation on your insurance policy is possibly much less. It may only be the 5% that is on top of your dwelling coverage so that you'll have that full dwelling coverage and your other structure coverage to rebuild your home without the debris removal cost uh, eating and eroding that coverage so you'll have more to rebuild the structure versus paying for debris removal. If you don't have that 5%, then our understanding is, is the agreement that the insurance, that your obligation will only trigger once you've rebuilt your home and you have additional uh, limits left in your policy. So if you've rebuilt your home and you have a $500,000 limit and it costs 600,000 to rebuild or 500,000 to rebuild, then you would not have any money left or an obligation under the, the consolidated program. So if you have questions specific to that, contact your local representatives. But if it's an insurance company issue where your insurance company is not complying with the, the general parameters I just laid out, contact us so that we can work with that insurance company to make sure that they're on board with how this operates. They mostly are, but depending on which adjuster you have, and how experienced they are with prior events, whether they're going to be fully knowledgeable about this. Another issue that's coming up is a replacement in another location. So if you decide to not rebuild on your current lot, but you either uh, and not rebuild on another lot, you may decide to purchase a new home in another location. We're one of the few states that does have a, a law in place that allows you to do that. So. What we made sure last year, which was prior to the campfire, we passed a law that clarified that you get your full coverage, all your different coverages that would have cost if you had built that home in the, in the lost location, and you, you'll be able to use that money to purchase that home, a home in another location. So you get your full replacement costs, you get your extended replacement costs, you get your building code upgrade, and you get your other side coverages that you would have incurred had you rebuilt that home. So you still have to go through the process of understanding what that cost is to rebuild that home that you lost, even though you're not going to be doing that, and then you'll know what that number is and you'll know what you'll have available to purchase that new home in another location. Some of the issues that come up with purchasing a home in another location is some companies will say, uh, give you an example, if you have a $500,000 policy where you have, uh, you've determined it's $500,000 you would get if you had rebuilt on your lost location 
and now you want to use that to purchase a $500,000 home in another location, some companies will say, well, wait a second, some part of that property you're purchasing has land underneath it, and we don't cover land, so you don't get the full 500000 that you thought you were going to get. We're going to take 150000 or whatever number off of that 500000 and then you're only going to be receiving the 350000 or, or 300000 uh, There is not currently good law in place to prevent that from happening. We have worked with several insurance companies, and several insurance companies have agreed to, to not take that deduction on land, but the, we cannot force them to not take that deduction. So with the companies that have decided we're, we're going to, there's no law in place to require us to do that, so we're going to take that deduction, they may still take that deduction. If you run into that, though, contact us. We'll see if it's one of the companies that we maybe we previously worked with, or we can even try and work with that company to see if they'll uh, not take that deduction if you, if you do go that route. The important thing about on the structure coverage is making sure you have an accurate scope of loss. Now, a lot of you are pretty far down the road here, but making sure it's tough to negotiate with your insurance company or to even get into an issue of, let's say, underinsurance, which I'll get to in a second, um, if you don't have an accurate scope of loss. So what's the scope of loss? Scope of loss is a complete description of what it would take to rebuild your home, breaking out every room, every kind of uh, uh, material used, the type of roof, the type of flooring, the type of kitchen, uh, et cetera, et cetera, the, the, the accurate square footage. So just ensure that that's accurate, because if you're missing 200 square feet, you're missing a lot of uh, coverage and, and, and money that, that would be due you, uh, and so keep that in mind. And so you, it's tough to negotiate with your insurance company if you don't know, if, you, if you're working off of different and inaccurate scope of loss uh, documents. Another issue that comes up is additional living expenses. Now, for a second, I'll talk about total losses on additional living expenses. Prior to September of last year, uh, the rule, the law after a disaster, a declared disaster, was you get up to, to 24 months of additional living expense coverage with no extension for a good cause. Luckily, in this area, um, it came in, it happened after that law, the new law was passed where we were able to get 36 months of additional living expense coverage plus extensions for a good cause. Now keep in mind, some of you have limits on your additional living expense coverage. So even though you may have more time, you need to watch your additional living expense limits to, to, to make it last as long as possible so that you're not in 20 months or 24 months already exhausting that limit, even though by law you're allowed to get more time, but you may not have more money left. Other companies don't have a dollar limit, they just have a time limit. In those cases, you can still collect through the 36 months plus extensions for good cause. Now, what is good cause? Those are circumstances beyond your control that results in a delay in the rebuild process. So what's important there is that you're keeping track of what each stage of what's going on so that you can show at, at some point in time that these, this three months was beyond my control or this six months is beyond my control so that you, you present that to your insurance company as you get towards the end of those deadlines and, pr and support your good cause argument. And obviously, again, I'll mention this probably 10 more times, you run into a dispute on that, come to us, we can walk you through that and work with your insurance company to make sure they're following the law and they're, and they're being reasonable with regard to whether they agree with you that it was good cause and something outside of your control that caused the delay in the rebuild process. Uh, let's talk about, uh, well, partial losses, let's talk about that for a second on additional living expense. That's a big issue. Um, the law is not good in that area in terms of this. When you have a, a partial loss, smoke damage, whatever it may be, and you have a standing home, you, you have a certain amount of time where you can re, uh, fix the damage in your home and remove the smoke damage and clean the carpets and do the, that sort of thing. But you may not have water, you may not have uh, other things. You may not be able to move in there because of 
uh, things going around uh, with other property where debris might not be uh, completely removed and there could be some hazardous issues there. Uh, unfortunately, the law is not there yet and we're still working on that to change the law. And the, the idea would be if you have a loss and even if you've rem remediated your property, if it's still uninhabitable due to, no, uh, due to neighboring properties or situations, let's, for example, you don't have water and no one expects you to be able to live in your home without water, uh, then you should still get additional living expense coverage. Now, we would need to pass a law to get that done, but those are some of the areas where uh, the total loss uh, claimants have a little more protection than the, than the partial loss claimants. And last thing on, on the, the actual claim part is the content coverage, the inventory. We were able to get a notice out to the insurance industry late last year requesting that all the insurance companies pay at least 75% of your content coverage up front without having you having to do an onerous inventory of everything you lost in your property. Um, we did get some success in that area. Many companies, a few companies offered 100%. Many offered 75, some didn't offer 75, but maybe 50 or some other number. Uh, the law doesn't dictate what they can do, but we were able to get a, a good amount of, of uh, agreement with the insurance industry. So if you're running into a situation where you're either you still didn't get what you think was agreed upon, the 75% or whatever it was, come to us so that we can uh, follow through with that insurance company, determine what they responded to us, what did they tell us they were going to do, and then we make sure we hold them to that. Now let's talk about underinsurance. Uh, some people are going to find as we get through this process that you're underinsured. Some people have a really good, had a really good idea at, at the onset. Some people are finding out um, soon or now that they're underinsured. It's important, uh, we can look at that issue. Again, the law isn't great in that area. It's not very specific, but there are certain situations where we may be able to assist you there. So it's important that you have information to give us if you are going to uh, present an issue to us for us to look at. For example, if, if, you, if you think you're underinsured and you don't have a, a scope of loss and, a, and, a, and a, a bona fide contractor's estimate that shows that you're, that you're underinsured, then it's difficult for us to go back to the insurance company and say, this person's underinsured. So the more documentation you can provide to us to support the, the fact that the full cost to rebuild your home is more than what your coverage was, then that will help us help you. Some of the things that we're able to, to assist, for example, if you, if you have documentation that you went to your agent or insurance company and asked for more coverage and they said, no, you're fine, and you have any documentation like that, I know that that's hard to come by. A lot of these conversations happen uh, orally and you don't have a, a good documentation trail, but we have had situations where people actually asked for more coverage and they were told, no, we're not gonna give you more. Uh, in those situations, we were able to help, uh, you know, bump up what those, those coverages are to where, where it should have been. So just keep that in mind. N now let's uh, talk a little bit about availability of homeowners insurance. You heard a little bit already, but uh, a couple things. If you, for claimants, for example, if you had a total loss, then you, you get, number one, they can't cancel, your insurance company cannot cancel your policy because you had that total loss. And number two, they must renew your next renewal. So you've either already gotten your next renewal or you may still get your next renewal. After that, then theoretically, uh, the, the law doesn't require them to renew you and you would be then left with shopping around similar to what you were presented earlier with that. Um, and, and with that, I just a couple things I'll add. Uh, just a clarification on the prior presentation. While we have limited authority with regard to surplus lines insurance companies called non-admitted insurance companies, uh, still come to us if you run into a dispute with that with those companies. We have some authority over those non-admitted companies. They're, they are not part of the guarantee program, so if uh, they go broke, for example, there's not a backstop for that. However, if, if they're uh, denying part of your claim or delaying unfairly, we could still look at some of those issues and 
and th in theory, we can stop them from writing new business if, if we feel they're not performing on those insurance policies. So, so please still come to us on that. With regard to some of the things you heard earlier on availability, what we're trying to do is to make sure that uh, the communities and the individual homeowners uh, go through and un have an understanding of what the insurance companies are looking for in uh, wildfire risk. And so with the wildfire score and the protection class score, it's important that your community works on a plan to ensure that they keep that protection class score down as well as your individual home in terms of defensible space and hardening your home and new construction with uh, you know fire safe materials etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, with that you know we're trying to propose a situation where uh, under current law for example the insurance company can still say yeah you may have a all this defensible space and you may have done all this work on your home but we're still not going to write in that area and sorry you know we're, we're not going to do it our we're going to propose that uh, we get a stronger consumer protection laws in this area so if you harden your home and you perform mitigation in your property and your community is let's say a fire safe community and meets certain standards that the insurance companies should be required to write you and not only that if, if you've mitigated your home and, and done, done these things and your community's done these things, then we believe in, in many cases you should get a, a mitigation credit on your premium to reduce the premiums. So those are some of the issues that we're hoping to pursue this coming uh, legislative session uh, as we get into January. Uh, let's see. Um, lastly, I'll just say you know, a, a lot of your issues, whether it's on the claim side or whether it's on renewals or, you know, I didn't get renewed or my, I got a big premium increase, you know, come to us, let us take a look at it to make sure that it's a, that the premium they're, charges, they're charging you, for example, it matches the, the rate filing that they submitted to us. Sometimes that, that we find that the math is off. Um, sometimes we don't, and, and it's still a high number, unfortunately, in some of these areas but at least come to us and let us take a look at it. You know, contact us at our 800 number, 800-927-4357 or online. We have a lot of information there with regard to uh, claims tips as well as the um, availability, affordability issue, some tips on uh, finding insurance, shopping around, list of all the insurance companies. We're about a month away from adding, and we have an agent finder on our website now and we're about a month or so away from uh, enhancing that so that it will also describe when you, when you look for an agent in a certain zip code or a certain city or a certain area, it'll also describe the insurance companies that they write for. And so you'll have a better idea so that if, if you know you, you're not going to get insured with company X, you'll, you'll know that um, you, you won't want to go and check with that same company. Um, but the first thing, obviously, you want to do is you want to check with your local agents and brokers, and a lot of them are here tonight, and, and see what they can do for you. And if you do, if you do run into where you're not able to get insurance or you, you feel you want to look for more affordable insurance and you want to shop around, you know, look at the tools on our website and see if that helps. Also, next year we'll be, we'll be enhancing what's called an, the Homeowner's Insurance Finder uh, tool that will also more specifically describe which insurance companies are writing in which areas, and our hope is that it'll even describe which scores they're writing in and which protection class they're writing in in certain areas, so you'll have a really good idea. Um, our, our additional goal is we want you to know your scores. Uh, most people just are told, you give your address, you call on the phone, you're the agent or broker, you go in, you give your address, sorry we don't write you, but you don't really know why. Um, and they may even say, oh, your fire line score, but they don't tell you you have a six or a seven or a 12 or, or what that score is. We believe every, if, if people are gonna be denied coverage for their, either their fire line score, and fire line is just a single vendor, there's three or four vendors besides fire line, but that's just an example, your wildfire risk score, most people know it as a fire line score. If you're gonna be denied coverage for your uh, wildfire risk score or your protection class, you should know what that score is. And, it, and you should also have the ability to appeal that score. For, you know, if you, if you believe that there's an error or you believe that, hey, they got this wrong somehow, 
And, and so that's another one of our goals is to try to get the ability to require insurance companies, agents, and brokers to give you those scores with, without you having to, to beg for them or find out uh, you know, the hard way what those scores are and then being able to appeal those scores uh, before that, ad, that adverse t action is taken by the insurance company. And lastly, we, we do have a mediation program in place. So for the claims area, if you, if you come to us and we go through the process and there are certain issues, let's say you're disputing the, uh, the value of the construction of, of the home or whether it's a partial loss or a full loss, and we really don't, uh, we don't, we don't decide, let's say a judge would, of no, it's gonna cost 500,000 to build your home or no, it's gonna cost 600,000 to rebuild your home. But we do have a mediation program that's free to you that the insurance companies are required to enter into. And we've had some success in getting a lot of claims uh, resolved and it's, and it's non-binding too. So if you, if you show up at the mediation program and the med they're outside mediators, independent mediators throughout the state, and you don't agree with what the mediator's suggestion is for uh, an award and a settlement, then you can walk away from it. So can the insurance company, but it, it is a good uh, barometer of kind of what you're looking at should you decide to pursue this, these claims further as to what you'll, be, what you'll be up against. And that's really about it. We have a table out back, uh, uh, you know, in the back, and, and I'll be out there, and we also have our staff there and we'll be there to help answer some questions. But you know, really the idea is we're available whether we're here in town or not through our 800 line. I know some of you have already filed some requests for assistance or complaints, uh, so-called, uh, that's what we call them, requests for assistance. Um, and if, you, if you're running into an issue where you feel that you know, it's, not, it's not going the way you think it should go, hey, let us know and we'll follow up on that. But thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. And thank you to all the organizations that came tonight to speak. Um, like we mentioned, all of the local insurance agencies will be outside. And just a reminder that all of this information and any rebuilding resource guide that you need lives on makeitparadise.org. And we will have another meeting on November 5th from 6 to 8 p.m. Thank you.